Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Hello again, and welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, Nico Perino, and today I am at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. to speak with Mustafa Akyol. Akyol is a senior fellow with the Institute's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. He is also an author of many books and a regular contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. Mustafa, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Before we dive in uh, to the main reason for our conversation today, which is to kind of shed light on the persecution of the Uyghur Muslim minority in China, which I think is vastly overlooked by most in the West, I want to start with a little bit of your background. You're from Turkey. I'm from Turkey, uh, indeed. I mean, I um, used to be a figure in the Turkish media. I had a newspaper column. I had a TV show. There's a lot of people that used to be figures in the yeah, Turkish media. I mean, there, <laughs> there are a lot of people who used to be in what used to be the Turkish media, which is now 90% of it is just different colors of the same Prada, I can say, unfortunately. Um, so I, I'm an author writing mostly about religion and public life and and, and freedom and how can we have a more, let's say, liberal understanding of Islam, liberal in the classical sense of the word. And I, I used to champion these ideas in my home country in Turkey uh, with my public presence column, books, uh, but I, uh, you know, I tilted towards the U.S. side in the past couple of years, partly because Turkey became a little bit inhospitable to, uh, you know, uh, journalists to these ideas, and especially journalists with the ideas that I'm dealing with. In what ways were they hospitable? Did you deal with a lot of what the journalists who are writing in Turkey today are dealing with? Any jail time or? Well, I mean, actually, I'm lucky and I shouldn't complain. I mean, I know, I mean, hundreds of journalists in Turkey went to jail. Some are still in jail. Uh, others have been detained and abandoned. So I didn't go through any of that so far in Turkey. Um, I went through that in Malaysia unexpectedly. That's a whole different issue. Yeah, I kind of want to get into that yeah, too because yeah. there's a reference to that in your bio. Yeah, I mean, me and my wife sometimes joke like we were expecting where I would get arrested. Oh, surprisingly, it turned out to be somewhere in Southeast Asia. We weren't expecting that. Anyway, what what happened is that uh, people like me lost their presence. I mean, you get a phone call from Ankara who says to your editor, this guy shouldn't write anymore. Uh, that happened to me. That happened to hundreds of people that I know because there is a whole new ideological line that the government wants to promote and impose and you're not a part of that line. Especially you're a bigger problem. If you used to be supportive of the government in the beginning, then you have some weight on its you know, supporters. But then it takes a different line and you say, no, 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 this is wrong. Then you become a bigger problem. So through that mechanism, a lot of people lost their jobs in the media. I lost jobs in the media as well. Uh, again, I'm not complaining from that. You know, worse things happen to people. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, Turkey is also in a very polarized state of affairs too. I mean, and I wouldn't be maybe f f uh, feeling fully comfortable in some opposition circles as well because it's all about division and polarization. And nuance analysis was not very welcome. Were you ever supportive of the government in any way? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm... So you say it's like, it's like a apostasy. If you were a supporter of them and then you kind of reversed... Yeah, that, there's a little bit... Like. Yeah, yeah. They call it treason. You know? <laughs> and well, this current government led by... President Erdogan, he was prime minister in the beginning, and, and his party, Justice and Development Party. Well, it's no big secret. I was a big supporter for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was a supporter because this was a party that was founded by conservative, pious Muslims, but it came to the scene in Turkey in the early 2000s, and it said, we want to join the European Union, and we will realize all the necessary reforms. And these were liberal reforms. Mm -hmm. More rights for Kurds, more rights for minorities, they changed uh, the legal code, I mean, the penal code. Uh, women gave more rights in, in certain reforms in 2004. So this was the synthesis that I always wanted to see in the Islamic world, uh, a, a synthesis where 
conservative Muslims still being true to their faith can accept the broad framework of liberal democracy, which includes freedom for everybody, freedom of speech, freedom from religion and off religion and all those values that I believed in. So it went on fine for quite a while, but then we realized that, I mean, we being the Turkish liberals, let's say, who supported this government, well, this government did these things because it needed, <laughs> because it had to, you know, save itself from the wrath of the secular military. So, and clinging on to the European Union rope was the safest way out. But once they uh, established themselves, uh, once they consolidated their power, they started to change. There were people in the party who wanted to remain loyal to the early, let's say, liberal line. They were all pushed out, uh, and and President Erdogan uh, gathered around him a ideological cadre of, you know, anti-Western, anti-liberal sycophants, basically, most of them. There are a few exceptions, but... So just it, it turned into something else. And I started to say, well, this is wrong. Well, this is wrong. When, what, when was this change happening, would you say? I think by 2011, when the Erdogan won a very decisive election, he felt more comfortable. After that, we started to see a shift in narrative. Mm -hmm. And a clear turning point, I think, was 2013. There were big, massive anti-government protests. And Erdogan, in the face of those protests, could have said, well, you know, some of our citizens have a problem. We'll listen to what they're saying. No, he said, this is an international conspiracy, you know. And these are spies of Western government. And there was the so coup so attempt so or the alleged And then came coup attempt came later, which made everything much worse. So Turkey went into a down, downward spiral. And I remember saying, uh, writing columns in 2013 saying, no, 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 this is not a conspiracy. You should try to understand that uh, society is diverse and there are people who have a problem with you because of certain things you say or you say do. So do not demonize the opposition. That was my, my line. And I, it didn't work. And I, I mean, I got a phone call. My editor-in-chief got a phone call from Ankara that I shouldn't write anymore. And so that was the end of it. And my editor-in-chief got fired a little while. Yeah, I was going to say, what happened because, to some of your colleagues? Because he was too still sluggish in obeying these commandments. So he, he got fired too. And the newspaper I was writing for uh, which is called Star, turn into an, uh, I mean, to me today, disgusting, but like uh, unabashed propaganda machine. Uh, but it was more nuanced, of course, in, when I was Would there. you say there's a free press in Turkey anymore? Well, uh, we can't speak of press freedom much. I mean, there are a few still independent newspapers that are still critical, uh, but they are all shrinking. Uh, they get their editor-in-chief arrested for a while and let go, or... Uh, or, for example, there are a few newspapers that are there, and if companies give advertisement to these newspapers, those companies get phone calls from Ankara saying that these are traitors, why are you supporting them, this will be bad for you. So those papers are kind of trying to survive, but all the major media, the papers that Turkey knew and read for decades, the big Hurriyet, Milliyet, these big newspapers, imagine them, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, They've all become one party line, and that is the line that you know venerates the president. So I've heard that President Recep Tayyip Erdogan does have considerable support in the country. Is that true? It it is true. I mean, here's the same the way thing. Putin has a lot of support yeah. in Russia too. Yeah, maybe a little less than Putin, uh, but yes. I mean, he. Here's one point before even getting to that. I think a lot of people have a simple freedom versus dictatorship dichotomy, which was maybe the case in the 20th century. In a country where you have elections, you would assume it's a free country. Well, actually, there's a spectrum right now in the world. There are countries that are liberal democracy. There are countries that are full dictatorship. And there are countries that are somewhere in between. And I think Turkey is in that somewhere in between category. President Erdogan is popular uh, among a certain part of the population, which is half of the country, roughly speaking, sometimes a little more, and that allows him to win the elections, which strongly identify with him. Uh, President Erdogan is a religious conservative. You know, his wife wears a headscarf. He's coming from the heartland. Uh, and there are a lot of people who live like him, who look at him and see their own values, own narrative, own language. And Erdogan is their president. 
and they almost like venerate him. They look up to him. And and before Erdogan, those people had certain problems in what we call the old Turkey now. I mean, there was an authoritarian secularism that I was critical actually of. So like wearing a headscarf and getting a public job was not possible. So there was some discrimination against religious conservatives. So Erdogan saved them from that and gave them power, glory, and revenge and all that. So these people are into Erdogan, like Chavez, you know, had an incredible uh, popularity in Venezuela. Um, but then you have roughly 48% of the country. I mean, the, the, these figures are interesting. Like, he, he has been winning elections with 51, 52, 53 And these are fair elections, in your opinion? Uh, not very fair, but they're not rigged. I mean, yeah, not I mean, fair in the sense that, I mean, he controls the propaganda resources. The media is all about pra- praising there's Erdogan. There's political intimidation if they're calling. There's political intimidation. I mean, you can go to jail if you're an opposition figure. Mm-hmm. Like the Kurdish party's leader, Selahattin Demirtas, is in jail. Sometimes when, uh, a, a in, in the Kurdish provinces, when a when somebody wins the election from the Kurdish party, the government can declare that person to be allied with terrorism. So they can just take them out and put their own position there. So th- you can't speak of fair elections, but also the ballots are really counted. I mean, with opposition mm-hmm. party people there. So the ballot, I mean, I think it is very unfair elections, but at the end of the end, that's that they're not rigged, at least so far. That is why Erdogan lost two major cities just recently, Ankara and Istanbul. Oh, really? But they're not trying to give Istanbul right now. They're asking for a rerun. I mean, there were municipal elections in Turkey in two weeks ago. Uh, Ankara, the capital, went to the opposition candidates now. And after 25 years of domination by Erdogan's party, the same thing happened in Istanbul too. But now in Istanbul, the government is trying to push for a rerun of the elections. They're finding some... You know, uh, technical justification. Yeah, they're trying to find a pretext uh, to to do that, and they're still working on that. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, maybe you'll see in the next couple of days. Uh, so the ballots so far have been at least honestly counted, but everything else. Well, you go to Istanbul, you see just the posters of Erdogan, yeah. right? And and you open the media. I mean, nineteen of the twenty news channels are uh, pushing Erdogan. Actually, the fact that he has not been controlling the ballots made him so willing to control the propaganda resources. Yeah. Uh, And that gives you what people call an illiberal democracy. Of course, the bigger problem is in Turkey, freedom of speech has come to so dramatic levels like that. There is a law about insulting the president. And if you insult the president, quote unquote, you know, you get a a few years of jail sentence for that. Even if you're not in Turkey, wasn't there a situation in Germany where a poet wrote something critical of Erdogan? Yeah, even a foreign country individual does that, you know, they try to take care of that. But the question is, what is insulting the president? And uh, people just say, you know, very hard, strong criticisms of social media and, and the police is, is at their door. I mean, 60,000 people have been prosecuted in the past five years for quote unquote insulting the president. And I think uh, probably none of them would, you know, be under any legal uh, procedure in a place like Norway or I don't know, uh, in a country where you have free speech. And he's very petty too. I have a colleague who's very critical of him on Twitter and he his Twitter account blocked her. <laughs> Yeah, Twitter gets blocked, and uh, and uh, like there are stories in Turkey. Like for example, this happened. Like on a bus, two people were speaking about Erdogan, and one of them was quite like, ah, he's he was very critical of Erdogan. And one of the people on the bus called the police, said that they are right now insulting our president on the bus, and the police arrested that person after that bus ride. Yeah. So like, and also that's the thing. Some of those people are behind this. Like, it's not people versus the state. Well, uh, the people who support Erdogan think that, of course, uh, the traitors should be punished. And they want more of it, actually. Hmm. So it's not so much that the economy is doing well and therefore the administration is doing well. The economy is pretty, pretty, doing pretty good in Turkey, right? It was. Actually, it is going down lately. Uh, and that cost President Erdogan some votes. That's why he lost Ankara and Istanbul. But there are people who would vote for President Erdogan no matter what. Because he's this it's like, personality, yeah, speaks it's, to the it's, heartland. And- yeah, it's like Peronism or it's like some this cult of personality. And, and when the economy goes wrong, those people believe that there is an economic attack on Turkey by these conspiratorial powers. And I think 
the power of conspiracy theory is such an amazing thing. Like I've seen it all my life, especially in Turkey. Like President Erdogan's political propaganda is all about conspiracies against Turkey. Like whatever happens, like tomato prices go up. President Erdogan speaks of a tomato conspiracy. And I'm not making making it up. He uses his words like vegetable conspiracy against Turkey or something. Well, prices go up because prices go up, right? There are reasons for that. I mean, the market. Famines, and, yeah. And, and your actually policies are causing that because, you know, President Erdogan has economic policies lately that are quite populist and, and I think harmful. Um, but if you believe in this conspiratorial narrative, uh, then you know everything's a plot, doctor's plot, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 so those people are in that ideological universe, and they do not uh, look at the president in in, a, in any critical terms. So when did you come here to the states? Um, well, I mean, I've been going back and forth for twenty years. Yeah, you're but a public figure. The mm-hmm. more uh, I mean, I moved, let's say, to the U.S. I began living here at the end of 2016, like at the beginning of 2017. Uh, I came as a visiting fellow to the Freedom Project at Wellesley College. Yeah, in Massachusetts. Then, uh, Massachusetts, yeah, that was like a three-term stay there. Then uh, I came to the Cato Institute as a, to join the Cato as a senior fellow. The Wellesley Freedom Project's an interesting project, one that we at FIRE have followed, and we actually created a video about it because there are some folks on campus and off campus who try to get it shut down. I mean, it's a project that seeks to expand the diversity of ideas on campus, talk about freedom both at home and abroad. Uh, and the students there um, just come under tremendous political and cultural pressure for being a part of it. Uh, but perhaps even more concerning than the the pressure they receive to to not be a part of the Freedom Project is what would happen if the project actually shut down. I mean, it's a haven for foreign scholars who don't feel safe in their countries. Yeah. yeah. Right? Well, I mean, I came to the U.S. and uh, of course I knew of U.S. politics, but on the campus I saw something different. I mean... Uh, I saw, wow, there are some freedoms of speech issues in the U.S. too. I, you wouldn't think of that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in particular in Wellesley, like like I had a great time in Wellesley. I appreciate Wellesley College for hosting me there. I appreciate Thomas Cushman, the head of the Freedom Project, who was at, at the time the founder and uh, the president of the Freedom Project for hosting me there. But also in Wellesley, I said, wow, there are people here who call themselves liberal but they use the term liberal in a different sense mm-hmm. <laughs> from what I mean. Because I'm coming from the, let's say, European tradition where the term liberal means classical liberal. It means maximal individual freedom, right? Within rule of law, of course. But here in the U.S., I said, oh, the liberals are trying to silence somebody for being uh, you know, hurtful or for being... Uh, somehow disturbing the students. And I personally faced that and I couldn't even believe. I'll, I'll tell you an example if you want. I mean, on Wellesley, when I was there, I gave several public seminars on the campus, which were just generally well received. And and I was happy to do that. One uh, topic was, I mean, one lecture was titled, Is Islam Compatible with Freedom? Oh, I remember seeing a flyer for that at Wellesley. It was defaced. Yeah. I mean, it was titled, Is Islam Compatible with Freedom? And... Uh, like, because this is the issue I'm dealing with. I mean, like, there are blasphemy laws or apostasy laws in Pakistan. People get killed or executed or jailed for saying something critical of religion. That is not very compatible with freedom. But as a Muslim myself, I believe, yes, we have these problems, but then there are solutions in Islam. There are liberal movements as well. These these medieval bans on blasphemy and apostasy even don't come from the Quran. The, it's just come from medieval interpretations. Christianity has dealt the with these thing, issues. Yeah. We can deal with these, and there are promising signs for change as well. So that was my, my broad scene. And I mean, I, I gave a talk which was well attended, more than 100, uh, I think, students in Wellesley. And uh, like I began with reminding Ibn Rushd Averroes whose works actually have been pointed out as one of the early steps for uh, freedom of speech, because he had this interesting line. He was critical of, for example, Imam Ghazali. He said, when you are refuting an opponent, always give them a fair share of their opinion, quote them in full, then put your ideas. Otherwise, it would be unfair. Yeah, restate their position better than they even could. Exactly. So Ibn Rush wrote that. And uh, some people said, well, he was actually speaking about what we call freedom of speech today. So that that lecture, which can be found online, was an idea, to, was an attempt to sh- highlight the sources of freedom within the Islamic tradition that maybe haven't flourished enough, but 
but we can floor, we can go and discover them. So, and but however, the title of the event is Islam compatible with freedom. Faced some protests on the campus, not big protests, but some let's mm-hmm. say objections. Um, and at the end of the conference, uh, one of the students who didn't like the title came up and said, "Well, you know what? I like the content of what you said so far, but the, your title is so offensive." I said, "Why is it offensive?" I didn't say. She said, "Because you're you're asking the possibility whether Islam can be even not compatible with freedom." Was she was she Muslim? She was not a Muslim, <laughs> and the Muslim students and actually were happy with. They loved it. They uh-huh. they got my signed copies, and you know, I established some good connections there. So a few of them still write to me, and I said, "Listen, uh, well." I believe Islam is compatible with freedom, but there are Muslims who do not think like that. So this is a valid question. We could have a conference here, is Islam compatible with democracy? I'll tell you, go to Taliban, they will say it is not. They will say democracy is kufr, it is heresy. I mean, it's it's unbelief. And so this is a valid issue to discuss in Islam. And I think if you can't have this discussion, you know, then we can't understand even what's going on. And uh, so... To me, that was like, wow, this idea that you shouldn't quote-unquote offend people. Of course, I don't believe in offending people. I'm not a rude person. I don't encourage people being rude. But to ask a question, is Islam compatible with freedom? That's not even rude. That's that's a valid question today. And some people already ask this. So as a Muslim, my job is to ask this question and offer my answer to it. So that was like, to me, it cannot be compared to Turkey levels, of course. Yeah. But freedom of speech can be challenged from different perspectives and sometimes it can be challenged for supposedly uh nurturing a quote-unquote more liberal society but liberal in a in a in a it's a kind of liberalism that i didn't think of as liberalism yeah it's they don't even want to have the debate at at wells i recall laura kipnis a feminist scholar tried to come to campus and she was protesting i think it even resulted in some faculty members saying that there should be some sort of prior review committee before speakers are invited. Yeah, yeah. And Ellis Dreger, there was protests that she shouldn't be able to come. She's a, another feminist scholar who used to work at, at Northwestern. It's this culture of conformity, and often it manifests itself in what uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff call as like this vindictive protectiveness, whereby people are bef- offended on behalf of other people. Like yeah. this person who yeah. confronted you wasn't even Muslim, but she was offended on behalf of Muslims and had even the audacity to talk to you, a Muslim, uh, about how offensive your talk yeah. was. Uh, and can I add one more thing on that? I mean, I, I've also seen uh, in the U.S. in the past three years that, I mean, the people who are trying to bring this religious, I'm sorry, thought policing on the campus, they're saying, oh, it's the right wing that is using uh, freedom of speech as a code word or something. Well, I would say, well, it is because you are the establishment here. If it was the other way around. I mean, if if you had a campus which was, Ninety-five percent of everybody was Republican. Probably it was the five percent Democrats who would be arguing for free speech because their events would be probably mm-hmm. canceled. I mean, and we see this whomever in the people. Too, yeah. I mean, people have this tendency to uh, listen and hear what they like, and you know, and and it, it, in Turkey, for example, I was once protested in a campus, uh, Galatasaray University in Istanbul, by a left-wing group. Because I, it was a time that you know NATO was discussed in Turkey, and I said, "Well, I'm glad Turkey is a member of NATO, and Turkey should remain a member of NATO." And they thought I'm a CIA agent or something based on that. I mean, <laughs> conspiracy have chan- power. <laughs> yeah, chanted for ten minutes saying that go away, you're imperialist, Zionist, whatever. I mean, not Zionist, but like let's say CIA or imperialism, mm-hmm. which is nothing to do. I just thought you know Turkey should be anchored in the West. Um, so. Well, if this was, that campus was mostly dominated by the left. And if you go to another campus in in Turkey, it would be dominated by the right-wing Islamist, let's say, nationalist crowd. So they would maybe shout out at something which they don't like. So therefore, freedom of speech can be challenged by people who have power, people who don't have power too, but especially people. But that power can be very different from one campus to another one one state to another, yep. one country to another. And so therefore, freedom of speech is not anybody's value. It's a universal value, I think, under which we are, uh, we should under, you know, under which we should operate. Because if we sacrifice it for uh, our own benefit here, then you won't have the uh, basis to support it somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, it's an insurance policy of sorts exactly. for when you need it. I want to ask you before we pivot to the, the Uyghurs in China, 
you were jailed in Malaysia. Yeah. You tipped your hat to this earlier. Let's just, can I just hear that story quickly? Sure. I mean, I was jailed just for a night, so I'm lucky again on that as well. But it's astounding. I mean, we talk about yeah. the situation here in the United States of cultural conformity, uh, freedom of speech on college campuses. It's kind of petty compared to uh, what yeah. you've experienced. Yeah, before. yeah. I mean, and- I'll tell you. I mean, I, I sometimes, uh, when I hear freedom issues in the U.S., I call them the first world freedom issues. Yeah. Uh, they are important. They are, and, and they're important. You need to challenge them there, though, before they get yeah, to. Yeah, they're important also because they create whataboutisms right. elsewhere. For example, in Turkey, I didn't say, say that. For example, a lot of people have been jailed in Turkey for quote unquote terrorist propaganda. Uh, well, the terrorist propaganda the Turkish government is going after is actually the critique of the anti terrorism measures of the government. I mean, by Turkish standards, Noam Chomsky would rot in jail forever because he mm-hmm. criticized the yeah. U.S. government's, you know, anti-terrorism measures. Let's say, uh, so Turkey is taking it to a very extreme position. However, once in a while they'll find something in the West, and they love that. Oh, you see, Amer- in America, this guy uh, got jailed as well. Like Assange is now a very popular thing in Turkey. I'm not a very big expert on the technicalities of the Assange case, but people like Assange. Oh, you see, they are jailing journalists as well. And their case is much more extreme than that, but they use these things as, uh, it, you know, it was in the Soviet Union called whataboutism, right? Yeah. What about this? What about that? So therefore, preserving freedom standards in the West is inter- inf- uh, certainly very important uh, because then if you lose it here, you know, it will be doubled. Uh, it will be multiplied by 10 in, in some other uh, places. Well, what happened in Malaysia... Uh, Malaysia has been a kind of hub for me in the past decade. I've been there five times. My books got published in Malay. Um, It's a Muslim society that is struggling with these issues of freedom. Uh, There is enough conservatism to be worried about, and there's enough room to speak about it. So it's Mm -hmm. an interesting case. Uh, At least I thought so. So uh, this was actually uh, from Wellesley. I went to Malaysia to give this lecture, a series of lectures. But one of them was on the issue of apostasy, uh, changing, abandoning Islam, and you know, become, becoming secular person, ch- taking out a religion. Uh, and I, I gave this lecture thirty minutes to a Malay audience mainly. I said, "Well, apostasy isn't a crime and should not be seen as a crime. Uh, people can't." change their religion and you know you can't do it anything about it you know i mean you can advise people <laughs> against it but you shouldn't force any courage and, and i refer to the quranic verse no compulsion in religion la uh, and i at the end i said well religion cannot be policed it's a matter of the heart you know you can't police religion and then <laughs> at the end five men walked in and they said we are the religion police oh jeez <laughs> And they said they heard complaints about my talk and uh, they were listening there and and now they will start an investigation. They took my photograph and got my uh, some ID information. They let me go that night, but next day when I was leaving the country, they apparently issued an arrest order. So they arrested me at the airport mm. and they said, uh, you violated the law uh, which bans teaching Islam without uh, permission from the state. Uh, so the jail p- term for that is two years in jail. So I'll, we will arrest you tomorrow. I will take you to pros- uh, Sharia prosecutor, and your you know mm. <laughs> your verdict will be given based on that. Like it was a bad night. I mean, what were you? They, what was running through your mind? I said like, why did I come to Malaysia? I could have just done Skype, right? I mean, I just I mean, I I had family back in Wellesley. I, I was really stressed. I mean, uh, it was a bad night and. They arrested me at the airport, took me to a different places, and ultimately locked me at the... They have a poli- religion police establishment. I mean, it's a police department, but specifically for religious crimes, quote-unquote. Yeah. And so I was uh, jailed there that night, and next morning I was taken to that court indeed. Two hours later, they indeed they interrogated me for long uh, with long questions. They let me go at the end. But that was partly uh, made possible with some phone calls. Uh, Turkey's former president is a friend of my father, not the current president. (laughs) But my father called him. He called the sultan of Malaysia. And the uh sultan's advisor called the court and whatever they said helped. So so there was some kind of diplomacy on, on behind the scenes that helped me get out of uh, that not everyone will get. And not everyone will get that again. I'm saying so far I've been lucky and 
Uh, but I, I, I've seen, uh, and, and after that, they banned my book right away. I mean, they let me go, but my book was officially, uh, it was one of the banned books. I mean, there are thousands of banned books in Malaysia. And now, actually, this month, there will be a hearing in Malaysia because my publisher is asking for unbanning my book. It will go to the high court. So uh, sometime this month, we will, we will maybe hear from them what, what will happen. Would you go back there? I, my wife wouldn't allow me to go <laughs> to go for at least in the foreseeable future. I mean, I could go there if you know someone gives me guarantee that you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, you know, there's no big rush for that. Yeah. What about Turkey? Well, I don't. Uh, I mean, I I went to Turkey last summer. It's not that I don't go to Turkey at all. It's my country. My parents are there. Uh, but I don't see a future for myself in Turkey in in a, such a political. Uh, environment in in such a media environment, uh, and well, it's it's a little bit stressful to go to Turkey. You don't know what what, yeah. what happens. Yeah, yeah. So. I I haven't been as critical of the government, at least <laughs> publicly, as you have. And there's a lot of history in Turkey. I would love yeah. to visit Turkey, yeah. but I'm also a free speech advocate who's yeah. interviewed many people about what's happening in Turkey, and you just never know. I mean, in Turkey, the problem is it's not clear what is crime and what is not. I mean, that's the worst sort of regime. That's the thing. I mean, like, not every government, not every critic of government in Turkey is in jail. I mean, Turkey is not North Korea, right? I mean, it's not mm -hmm. like there are people who are vocally critical of the government. Well, they're not in jail, but then, well, one of them is in jail. So you don't know how, how that ex exactly works. Uh, so that's why, I mean, I, I say like they, they arrest 10 people, then the rest thousand people get an idea. Yeah. So, and that is not what Turkey should be. Uh, I hope, you know, better days for Turkey will come, but right now it's really in a grave situation in terms of authoritarianism and, and political, uh, zealotry. I want to turn now to the situation in China uh, with the Uyghur Muslims, which I think hasn't gotten as much coverage in the West as it should. Uh, the Uyghur Muslims, they live in the Xinjiang pri pro yeah. province, which is in Western China, and they're a Turkic people, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, and there is this thought in China that they are terrorists or could be terrorists. Uh, there have been some protests that have resulted in death in the past, but starting uh, a couple of years ago, the Chinese government underwent this huge campaign to what reeducate them, uh, which I think is a <laughs> the wrong word for what's actually happening. They're interning them in camps and trying to give the, get them to renounce their religion. Um, it's thought reform at the basis level. Uh, there's there's torture. There's beatings. Uh, in some of the Uyghur communities, you have to go through checkpoints. It looks like every hundred yeah. meters or something. And there's this article that was just published in the New York Times yesterday. I don't know if you've had a Face chance. recognition? They're now using face recognition yeah, yeah. technology to determine who is a Uyghur and who is not a Uyghur. And there's, I think Human Rights Watch or Human Rights Campaign came out with this report that they're actually putting people in Uyghur households uh, with the idea to essentially cleanse the culture, yeah. the Uyghur yeah, culture yeah, yeah, yeah. from China. So let's start by just kind of talking about who the Uyghurs are. Sure. Well, first of all, I should say, I mean, I'm from Turkey. And in Turkey, we know the Uyghur issue for decades mm -hmm. because Uyghurs are a Turkic people, which means their language is similar to modern-day Turkish. We, it's hard to understand exactly, but, you know, if you listen enough, you can get to it. Yeah, it's like the dialects you, it's you a see dialect, in Italy, yeah. for example. It's a, yeah. I mean, they are distant cousins of, you know, the Turks of, let's say, Turkey, let's say. And... Um, since uh, the communist revolution in China, East Turkestan, as they call it, or Xinjiang, you know, the Chinese call it, is a, is a region dominated by the Beijing regime. And uh, it is the China's western, northwestern edge. Mm -hmm. So it is China's uh, gateway to Central Asia. And it's to, pretty rural, right? It's pretty rural, but it's become a very important place because of transportation. I mean, just China is building a new whole new modern Silk Road called the Belt, uh, Belt Road, Road and Belt Initiative. Yeah. It will include uh, roads and natural gas and a lot of you know uh, investment and everything. So China is just opening up with this all the way to the uh, to all the way to Europe. It's going to go there. China will build highways and. Uh, for its own economic advantage, for other countries, it's going to help as well. So it's passing through oh, this, this Uyghur region. So stabilizing this region for China is important. Now, the problem is, for uh, it's like Turkey's Kurdish question. 
for decades, the Chinese majority, Han majority, thought that since these are Uyghurs, they're Muslim and they're Turkish, they're not Chinese, uh, we have to be careful about them. And, and that carefulness, quote-unquote, made the Uyghurs feel persecuted, and that persecution created a reaction, and that reaction created more crackdown. It's just a vicious cycle. China first began uh, deep, uh, changing the population. Millions of Han Chinese were moved from central China to this region over decades uh, to change the demographic balance of the place. There's something like 11 million Uyghurs. In, yes, in there are 11 million Uyghurs, millions of Chinese Han majority people were put, and these people got the government jobs, the better jobs, and so on and so forth. So Uyghurs felt like they're being colonized by these people. So that led to an Uyghur resistance movement, not mostly nonviolent. Turkey used to be their hub. You know, it's called the East Turkestan movement. They have their flag. You know, it's a Turkish flag, like with blue and red. Uh, so campaigning about this and so on and so forth. It's been going on for a long time. But in the past two years, it got more intense. Last, let's say three years from 2016. Uh, because there, before that, there were a few terrorist attacks because this resentment among Uyghurs ultimately led to the formation of some militant groups. One is the East Turkestan Islamic movement, which had has a violent uh, strain in it, and they 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 bombed uh, a Chinese station. They attacked a few Chinese officials. So, th so there, there a pr terrorist problem emerged here. But yeah, there was some sort of attack after Xi Jinping visited. Exactly yeah. after the president went. Now, when you have a terrorist attack, you have a problem. Yes, it's clear. So we can't deny that the Chinese have a security problem here. But uh, there are different differences between how liberal democratic governments respond to terrorist problem and how China responds to this problem. I mean, if you are a kind of liberal democratic government with a sense of rule of law and human rights, you would say, okay, within this population, there are some extremists. So let's monitor these extremists. Let's look at these small group of people. Um, and also let's understand what's their problem. Maybe their problem is something we're doing to them in the first place, right? Uh, well, the Chinese way of looking at this is, well, this population is breeding terrorism, so we should transform this population. Uh, religion, they're Islamic extremists, so Islam is a problem. Let's eradicate Islam. And it's, it's, it is also coming from their own communist ideology that you know, China is not friendly to any religion at all. Let's sinicize, let's you know, make them more Chinese in, their, in terms of their culture, language. And so, so they started a whole campaign of totalitarian transformation of the Chinese uh, Uyghur population. Um, this started when uh, Chen Guangzhou, who was a, a Chinese ruler and you know, commissar in Tibet, was moved from that region to here to bring law and order. Because they had Lord. seen that or thought he had done a good job in Tibet. Yeah, yeah. He's, 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 he's subdued there. So, good job so, in quotes, yeah. of course. <laughs> so he's the tough guy. So they brought him and he started this new policies. Uh, and they banned religious extremism, right? But what is religious extremism? I mean, if you if you say, well, there are religious groups who are preaching for violent jihad, okay, you can ban that. I mean, I can understand that incitement to violence. Well, for them, religious extremism is having long beards, wearing a headscarf, fasting in Ramadan, just being too religious, according just being to Chinese religious. standards. Yeah. Just being religious, according to Chinese standards. And uh, so that's that policy began. So if you're a government official, first of all, you can't have any any religious activity. Uh, if you're doing it secretly at homes, the government will come and monitor your homes. Uh, and then they started these big uh, camps uh, in the past two years. Uh, I call them the new gulags, you know, like reminiscent of the of the Soviet model. And yeah, you had an op-ed in the New York Times called China's Gulag for Muslims. And yes. you draw comparisons to what uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn talks about in the Gulag Archipelago yeah, that happened in the Soviet Union. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, well, the Soviet gulags were had less technology and were more maybe crude in that sense. But these are similar things. I mean, you you accord, and nobody knows exactly the figures and everything because in China everything is there's hidden. an estimated and, one million in yeah this camps. one million estimate and these these estimates come from 
reports from Uyghurs, just satellite photos showing the size of these places. Because from air, I mean, you can see a new whole place is being built. And uh, and all the people put in these places. So a million is a number. And China first denied that they exist for a long time, didn't speak about it. And at the end, they said, well, these are vocational training centers. We teach them uh, skills. Well, if you're going to teach them skills, you can open a school, people can go there, and at night they can go back to their family, right? No, no, you lock these people here. And and from uh, inmates who are able to get out, we know that it's not, I mean, they yeah, what they call vocational skill is actually forced labor. They make these people work during the day. At night, they are gathered and they have to listen to the communist propaganda. They have to sing, sing marches and uh, long live Z, uh, President Z, and, uh, and the they actually Communist have to Party. Pro- profess. They have to renounce yeah, they, their their previous beliefs. It's Orwellian. Yeah, in, it's it is. In, in it's the like most- the uh, Cultural Revolution in China. I mean, Cultural Revolution. That was in Mao's time. People had to confess their that they are bourgeois or they are capitalists, and they have to con- uh, like condemn all that, and they became new people, right? The new uh, new new man new woman. And so there is a little bit taste of that. And China is doing all this in the camps. Plus now, I mean, the story you mentioned is interesting. They have now built, as we read in the media, uh, face recognition techniques. Like uh, that is the interesting thing. In, in China, we're seeing cutting edge technology serving totalitarian ends. That the Nazis would salivate at if they had... Exactly. And other countries can buy this. Like, I mean, they, they have created these uh, facial recognition techniques. Like, you know, in the in the West, there might be facial recognition. When you look at the camera, it knows who you are and opens the door for you, that kind of stuff. But they said Uyghur facial uh, features are built, put into software. So if you're an Uyghur walking in Beijing, st- city cameras will map you so they will know who, where the Uyghurs are walking. Uh, they have drones made uh, look that looks like birds. They look like actual birds. And it's monitoring on especially Uyghur areas. So it's just, and I think China may have a legitimate security concern here, but it is going to exacerbate that with all these things because the, all that oppression will probably make some China, Uyghurs more radical and probably they will have more of that. And it gets into a vicious cycle like that. And, and I think for the broader story in the world is that, well, we should understand that totalitarianism, dictatorship, tyranny is not gone. It's still there. It can come up in a 21st century version. It can come up with cutting edge technology. I mean, let's not forget that China is now the world's second economy. It's will maybe the first one uh, in, in the decades to come. And it is uh, creating very high-end technological products, which may be sold to other places. Now, if you're a dictator who's happy with uh, the Chinese way of monitoring your uh, your society, you will go and buy it from China. Yeah. And, Ch- and China will not have any concerns about selling them to you. Yeah, it's a modern-day Star of David. Of exactly, course. exactly. What has the response been from the West? It, I, and Not even just the West, um, the rest of the world. It's been pretty muted is my understanding, because a lot of these countries that you would think would protest this have strong trading relationships with China, and they're worried that there will be negative ramifications. Well, the Western response actually hasn't been that bad, especially in terms of media. It's picking up a little bit. Yeah, picking up. I mean, the media, let's say the New York Times, the Atlantic, I mean, big newspapers, magazines in the US have written about this, and I appreciate that. Uh, Western politicians, some of them have spoken about this. I appreciate Marco that. Rubio. Marco Rubio has made a case on this. I mean, he's coming from Cuba. You know, he has an idea how communism works, and uh, China is, I think, not economically but politically still communist. So I appreciate those efforts. Uh, in the U.S., there is an East Turkestan lobby or Uyghur lobby here. They're trying to make uh, their voice heard, and I'm glad to see that you know they're 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 being heard. Uh, so that is all welcome and fine. Uh, the, the, that very um, Western interest in this issue is, of course, being played by China as to argue that this is all a Western conspiracy or libel and so on and so forth, which is not true. Well, they've denied. They early on were denying this, and now they're, they're just calling it. them. I mean, if if Western newspapers didn't write about this, they would not even say that this exists. So they they had to admit it at some point. Now the biggest disappointment is, of course, but not a big surprise, is the Muslim world. And I mean, Uyghurs are Muslims and the persecution of Muslims typically should be a concern for other Muslims. 
but on the on this issue there's incredible silence uh turkey had to be the first country to speak about this for a long time the turkish government said nothing and we know because turkey has ties with china turkey is actually now feeling quite at home in eastern capitals and western ones a turkish foreign minister promised the chinese foreign minister that we won't allow anti chinese propaganda in turkey two years ago, about a year and a half ago. So that made Turkey stay silent for a long time, only until a few months ago, luckily, the Turkish foreign ministry issued a statement on this, condemning the camps and saying that it's a shame on humanity. So that wasn't fine. Is I, it that they don't have a natural constituency? I know they're a, a Sunni, right? The, the no, there is a... Actually, the reason why that, I think, statement from the Turkish foreign ministry came is that in Erdogan's own base... There is growing growing recognition of this problem, and there is some unhappiness with the government saying nothing on this. So that might have triggered the foreign ministry statement. But still, Erdogan himself hasn't said anything on this. In Turkey, that's generally what matters. And I mean, President Erdogan doesn't shy away from slamming Israel when there's a, a issue in Palestine. When uh, he's he's sometimes right because there are uh, sometimes he doesn't write use the right language exactly precisely, but he's right in standing up for uh, human rights violations uh, when it is against the Palestinian people. But here's a much bigger case in China, and President Erdogan said anything about this. Uh, Turkish politicians haven't said it. It was just a foreign policy, a foreign ministry statement, which is fine, but not enough. But when you look at the Muslim world, rest of it, it is worse. And uh, I mean, there was an interesting uh, interview with uh, the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan about this recently. Uh, it was a Western journalist was asking him, so what do you think about the Chinese persecution of Uyghurs? And he said, well, I don't know what it is. Like, we didn't hear much about this. We don't read it in the newspapers. Like, it's not credible. It's not possible. Well, Ch Pakistan has good relations with China. It's partly strategic because Pakistan and India are in a big tension for ages. Mm -hmm. And China t traditionally takes the side of Pakistan on that. So I understand, but at least... Uh, even not without defying China, Muslim leaders can voice their concerns, saying that if you do it like this, uh, you will have only more problems. We don't find this right. You can't b uh, blame people for being Muslims. You can force them to eat pork, you know, in their camps. Yeah, forcing them. I to mean, eat for pork, Muslims, it's a big deal. Yeah, drink alcohol. Yeah, uh, cut their beards. There's yeah. a law in China against abnormal beards, exactly. which is. And I think this this whole China uh, Uyghur issue should be a wake-up call for Muslims all around the world. Uh, f there are, there are anti -Western, strong anti-Western currents in many Muslim societies. The West is the colonial power. The West is the supporter of Israel against Palestine. And so the, it is seen as Islam versus the West. And there's that kind of perspective. I mean, uh, Samuel Huntington wrote about this, and he actually said this is the where the world is going, Islam versus the West. And he thought China will be an ally of Muslims, actually, in that civilizational divide. In, in his book and article, uh, The Clash of Civilizations, Huntington, people remember The Clash of Civilizations, but he, he, they don't remember that he said the Chinese civilization and Islamic civilization might be together against the West in the future. Now, I certainly don't want the Chinese civilization. Well, that might still to happen. Be, to, th that might happen, but I mean, the Uyghur case shows that it will be a very bad thing. I mean, I mean, what the what Muslims need in the modern world? Uh, to me, they need freedom. They need religious freedom. They need to be who they are. They don't need to impose it to other people, but they need the freedom to be good Muslims in the way they understand it. Well, chi the Chinese universe shows that that's not what you're going to find under a totalitarian uh, the ruler, ruler uh, totalitarian regime. And uh, th th that's why I think that this whole Uyghur issue should be a wake-up call uh, for Muslims who think the West is the problem. Well, if you think the West is a problem, then see the alternatives and, and, and wake up. Well, that's what China will use. I mean, at first they were denying this was even a problem. Then they tried to frame it under, oh, these, this is just assimilation policies. We're teaching them about Chinese history and culture. Um, and then they started going into the whataboutism that you were talking about before. Oh, well, America has racial issues and look at what they're doing. There's uh, you know shootings of unarmed black men. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's... <sighs> I don't know. Do you see 
increasing pressure on China? Where do you see this going in the next couple of years? I don't see increasing pressure on China. There's no due There's, process either. They'll just... Well, there is there is pressure on China by Muslim civil society groups or intellectuals mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. But Muslim governments are really silent on this. It is very clear that China is giving the message that you should not criticize us on this. Actually, they openly write this. I mean, I, uh, I'm i reading the Chinese uh, media and... Uh, there was an article uh, in, 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 in a pro-government newspaper a while ago. It was saying, if Turkey doesn't speak responsibly on the Xinjiang issue, this will have consequences. So China, even they write it on newspapers, I'm sure in private conversations, they say, do not criticize about this. Because in the Chinese worldview, uh, there is no concept of there can be a human rights problem in a country and other countries can't criticize it. Well, it's all domestic affairs. Right, it's our domestic. How dare you? It's national sovereignty is the most important thing here, and actually that plays into the ears of a lot of Muslim dictators. Right, they also love national sovereignty in the sense that they don't want to be bothered by international norms of human rights and freedom, the freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Um, well, I mean, I'm sure a lot of governments will keep aligning themselves with China uh, on this issue, uh, but for I think Muslim intellectuals, Muslim civil society activists. Uh, Muslim scholars, this should be a, a thing to consider. There's uh, the world, I mean, they typically think, oh, the world is uh, East versus West. China is a different geostrategic power. Maybe it will balance the West. Well, maybe it will balance the West geostrategically, but will it be really good? And uh, will you prefer to live in Xinjiang or in London or yeah. Where can you be a uh, true Muslim uh, in, in, in one of these uh, environments? And so China certainly shows us a world where you will have technology, you will have trains and uh, shopping malls and whatever, but there won't be freedom. Uh, and, and as a Muslim, that's not the world I think is good for me and for my children and for my co-religionists as well. Uh, and uh, And I think... One thing, China shows us that if a government is threatened, it can do anything to you know feel itself secure on certain things. I mean, they have a certain rationale. You know, Uyghur region is important for us. There are some authoritar- there are some Islamist groups, violent. We should crack down on them. Now, probably nobody, probably not much progress will take place in China because the Chinese media will not be able to write about this and appeal to the common conscience of ordinary Chinese. We actually know that. I mean, Chinese media, when they write this, you know, our mighty government is still cracking down on terrorists, and that's wonderful, and so on. That, and that's you, all why they hear. You probably can't find counter-narratives because they censor the internet. Exactly. And and that is why, to come back to the issue that we were being speaking about, freedom of speech is so important. Mm-hmm. I mean, if... Western societies are not necessarily nicer than other societies, or Western people are not necessarily more compassionate or this and that. But I think freedom of speech is a key thing. Freedom of speech has allowed Western societies to go forward in human rights. Uh, If your country opens Guantanamo Bay and imprisons there, it's a human rights problem. But you will have newspapers writing about this. You will have civil society activists. You will have people protesting in front of the White House. And that will have some effect on the government. Uh, How slavery was abolished, because people wrote about it. Uh, People wrote novels, Uncle Tom Cabin. And some people had, wow, yes, there is a real something that really comes to our conscience here. Yeah, John Lewis, the congressman, civil rights activists said that without freedom of speech, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. Exactly, exactly. And that is what uh, civil rights movements in many po- countries are, uh, because you you are a civil rights movement, you make a few protests, the government comes and beats you and you know, puts you in jail. I know that happened to people in the US too, during, but still, they would have ultimately the right to organize rallies and so on and appeal to people and appear in the media. In a society, if you don't have that, you won't have any progress. You won't have any uh, any conscientious progress in the society because people will not hear about it. I mean, I know this from the Kurdish scene in Turkey. For example, in Turkey, um, for decades, the Kurdish language was banned. You couldn't speak Kurdish in public. That itself was a crime. Like It was called separatist propaganda. And uh, the overwhelming majority of Turks didn't know this. 
I mean, they didn't know there are people called Kurds in Turkey. Uh, it's 10 to 15 percent of the Turkish population. Nobody writes about it. I mean, I didn't, as a child growing up in Ankara, I, I heard the term Kurd a few ones. Maybe I thought it's somewhere in Afghanistan or something. Yeah, These they're, they're southern Turkey, right? They're yeah, southern. yeah, they're in southern Turkey now in big cities as well. But the the Kurdish issue, I mean, the reality that, wow, there are Kurds and we banned their language and that was wrong. That became recognized in Turkey in the 90s when you had first time free media not just government newspapers, but free, new, like private newspapers and, and uh, sorry, private TV channels, uh, discussion programs on, and you could see Kurds speaking on TV with an accent that's different than yours. And wow, these people are there. So uh, that's why uh, freedom is not the solution to everything, but freedom is the medium in which only we can find solutions to problems. And we lo if you lose that for any reason, uh, we will be really shutting ourselves uh, off to any progress on anything. Before we close out here, um, kind of, to kind of expand the persecution of Muslims, I want to just briefly address another situation because I don't want to be seen to overlook it, which is happening in Myanmar with the Rohingya Muslims. And in and, and China, you, of course, have these internment camps. You have this um, technocratic su surveillance state. There's torture, sleep deprivation, solitary confinement. Um, but in Myanmar, you have an actual genocide, yeah, it seems yeah, like. Yeah, it's more violent. I mean, in China, it's authoritarian. They lock you up. In in Myanmar, people were killed, villages were born, women were raped and massacred and so on and so forth. Uh, because that's not, that's happening through uh, army and, 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 and also militant mobs, you know, attacking yeah. these people. And you know what's interesting in Myanmar? Uh, what is happening to the Rohingya minority in Myanmar in the past several years is like mass atrocity. I don't know whether technically called genocide, certainly ethnic cleansing, horrific thing. And this is caused by mostly Buddhism. <laughs> yeah. But not the Buddhism that we know or that is in the polite and, you know, and, and otherworldly and just, you know, doing peaceful practices. It's a very militant Buddhism uh, turned into ethnic nationalism against the Rohingya. And there are Buddhist monks who have been cheering for these attacks. One of them uh, actually made the cover of the Times magazine a couple of years ago as the, the face of Buddhist terror. Uh, and, and he speaks of Muslims as serpents, you know, that has to be eradicated and so on and so forth. Well, this is a militarized, militant, hateful version of Buddhism, which is actually, their Buddhism turned into an identity, ethnic identity, like the Balkans, in the Balkans, you know, Serbian and Croats yeah. killed each other, and, 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 and they killed Bosnians for being from a different group, not on, the, it's, the issue was not theology, but ethnic identity. So uh, in Myanmar, we're seeing that, which shows that, well, any identity can be uh, radicalized, any identity can turn uh, militant. Today, there are huge problems in the world of Islam. There are groups that are referring themselves on Islamic uh, texts. Uh, they call themselves jihadists. And so I admit all these problems in the Muslim world, and I think we should focus on these and work on these. However, we should see that, well, it's human nature. And I think you can see militancy, hate, uh, genocidal tendencies in, in any community. And, 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 and the right to stand up against that is crucial. And that is part related to freedom of speech. In, in, in Myanmar, again, what the people hear in the media is that our government is fighting the terrorists, and that's all what we should know. Yeah. Well, Mustafa, I think we have to leave it there. We're at about an hour now. I want to thank you again for coming on the show. You've given us a lot to chew on. Thank you. It's my pleasure. That was Cato Institute Senior Fellow Mustafa Akil. To learn more about Mustafa's work, you can visit his website at mustafaakil.org. That's M U S T A F A. A-K-Y-O-L.org. Or you can catch him in the pages of the New York Times, where again, he is a regular contributing opinion writer. And his Twitter handle is Akil in English. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleague, Aaron Reese. It was recorded on Monday, April 15th at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org or call in a question for a future show at 215 215- 
315-0100. If you enjoyed this episode, please, please, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thanks again for listening. Thank you.